Today on Retire with Purpose, how to generate tax-free income during retirement, why safe money might be losing money, and how your advisor's age may be shaping your portfolio. Are you prepared to retire with purpose? To retire knowing your savings is invested to meet unavoidable needs and expenses. It's not how much we make during the good times, it's how much we keep during those really bad times. Certified financial planner Casey Weed is president of Howard Bailey, an advisory firm that believes successful retirement begins with a detailed financial plan personalized to help achieve your life's purpose. Whatever risk you face, we've got a plan. The Howard Bailey team is committed to practical financial planning so you can enjoy family and the future without uncertainty certainty or stress. Stay tuned and learn how you too can retire with purpose. Thanks for joining us. My name is Lee Kelso. I am here with Casey Weed, Certified Financial Planner and the President of Howard Bailey Financial. The uh, mission of this program is to help you plan for a retirement that has real purpose in your life. And one of the tools that Casey uses is something called the Weekend Reading for Retirees and Pre-Retirees, articles that uh, you can sign up for. They come by email once a week, and they really kind of help you uh, think through some of the important challenges that we all face in retirement. That's where we're going to start today. One of the articles was six advantages of indexed universal life insurance. And what about this article really caught your attention? Yeah, well, one of the interesting things, I think, about some of these articles that I put out are these are articles that I'm reading or Vice President Marshall Johnson's reading or other, art, or other advisors are reading to educate themselves to make sure they're providing the very best advice or staying on top of the latest trends. This was from really an industry periodical provider, Think Advisor, and, you know, that's, that's why I, I like to provide these because it allows people to get kind of behind the scenes and see what we're reading and what we're thinking and why we're talking about the things that we're thinking. And sometimes, you know, honestly, they can get a little technical, but that's why I like to break it down and say, this is what I think is most valuable, valuable about this article. And in this instance, you know, I like this article about index universal life insurance because it talked about the advantages. I think it's really hard to find articles out there that are positive or at least balanced. A lot of the times they're talking about all the disadvantages or why you shouldn't do this, why you shouldn't mm -hmm. do this. And, and I think we need to keep an open mind to why we might do something. That was something that my dad did with me ever since I was a little kid, it was always, well, even though you think this is a horrible way of doing things, even though I think this is a really bad idea, look at all the other people that think it's a great idea, so keep an open mind and go out and find out why they think it's such a great idea. And this is one of those instances. I think life insurance, cash value life insurance in particular gets a bad rap because there's a lot of people out there that are saying that it's just a bad solution. It's not something that has any advantages, and I wouldn't use it for our largest savings vehicle for our family. Uh, my dad uses it, my mom uses it, uh, the majority of our financial advisors use it, the, the people that work on our team use it, and a lot of the families we work with use this tool as well for their retirement savings. And it has a lot of advantages, be that tax-free income, uh, growth poten potential and, and principal protection, uh, even long-term care benefits, a lot of the things that were outlined in this article as advantages. And I think part of it is that you know, we're talking talking about a vehicle that is indexed universal life insurance. A lot of brokers may only be able to sell whole life insurance. You may be working with an advisor that has a limited menu of options and they only work in the market. And so instantaneously, all of a sudden, all the other solutions that they don't have access to become bad solutions. Sure. And so we need to make sure we have our mind open so we know all the potential solutions that are out there. Well, you just ticked off some of the advantages. Which one do you think is, is the most important for people to consider? Yeah. Well, I think out of all the advantages that were listed, and we can't go through every single one here on the show, but the biggest one is you get growth potential along with principal protection. And I think whether we set this up as a tax-free income vehicle or a tax-deferred vehicle, you know, there's different ways you can establish these kinds of vehicles. I own them both set up as tax-deferred and, and tax-free. And the reason that I use them is largely that I am fairly risk-averse, and I want to play place where I can put some cash where, you know, I don't want to make two or three percent like we do at the bank or getting a government tre 
treasury bond for that matter. I want more growth potential in that, but I don't want to put it in the market necessarily where, yes, I could make 7 to 10%, but I've got that stress that I could lose 50% over the next 12 months. I don't like that stress, and my wife really doesn't like that stress. She loves that we put money in these vehicles because she knows, okay, we've got principal protection, but we can still participate in the upside of the market to a limited extent. That might be 50, 80% of the market's gains. It might be 10, 15% uh, limit on our gains, depending on the vehicle and how we actually set it up. But we get that growth potential with the principal protection. And a lot of the families we work with, you know, they're at that stage in retirement where they're not really concerned with hitting any home runs. Right. They just want consistent, reliable returns that help outpace inflation and give them a better return than they can get in a lot of those other standard safe vehicles that are out there. You know, everybody's always thinking about tax-free uh, income, and you usually associate that with Roth. How, how do these right. vehicles generate that? Well, Index Universal Life Insurance, even whole life insurance for that matter, often it's referred to as a super Roth because you get that tax-free growth on those dollars and you don't have a limit on how much you can contribute, you know, depending on your insurability for that matter and making sure you're sure that you can actually uh, establish that insurability to justify the insurance coverage that you're going to get, then you can fund it with 10,000, 100,000, 500,000 a year. It just depends on certain factors, but there's really no limit on those contributions. Like with your Roth IRA, mm -hmm. it's limited to say 65 500 a year or $5,500 a year, you have limits on those contributions. And so with, with this particular vehicle, you get rid of those limits and it comes out of the same tax code as the Roth IRA and the Roth 401k, where you now actually have the ability to fund it and it gets taxed on a first in, first out basis. So when you start taking distributions, your principal is going to come out first and then your gains will come out last. And then once you get down, sometimes you might take that principal out first, get down to the cost basis and begin to take loans. And those are loans of which you're paying interest back to yourself. And so you're putting yourself in a position where you can create that tax-free income during retirement. Those loans, if we could really get into it, work incredibly well if we know how to establish it appropriately. We can take 100000 out. We could have a 3% fixed rate on a loan and a 3% fixed rate of interest. So we've got a net zero loan. We don't end up actually paying any interest. I right, gotcha. One of the uh, you know negatives often sell best, and one of the negatives used against these tools are all the fees and commissions that the the agents make. Yeah, and you know I I had a conversation with one of my best friends about this. He was my best man at my wedding, and we were uh, talk, we talk in the car all the time. And and he got on the phone with me, and he was asking about contributing. He was doing a a, a backdoor Roth uh, with his advisor. That's why he chose to work with this person is because they could get him into a Roth IRA when he was over the income limits. And I said, well, really, should every financial advisor know how to do a backdoor Roth? And better yet, he said, well, what do you do? You don't do a backdoor Roth? I'm like, no, I don't do a backdoor Roth. I do index universal life insurance. And he said, boy, isn't that a bad idea? I mean, that's just a bad idea here. I don't like that. I mean, that was his instant response. I don't like that. And I said, well, why? He said, well, it isn't just high commissions? I said, yeah, if it's set up inappropriately. And that's one of the advantages this article lists out is the design of these products is so flexible. That can be an advantage and it can be a disadvantage to the consumer because it can be set up in such a way when we do this that we're going to lower that death benefit as much as we possibly can to reduce the cost of that policy. So my policies that I've established over the lifetime of these accounts are going to have an average cost that's less than the average cost of your average U.S. equity based mutual fund. But that's because I've looked at the IRS guidelines. They're what they call their seven pay test. I've lowered the death benefit as low as I can get it in order to max maximize the cash value, keep the, the cost as low as possible, but the agent could do the opposite. I think mm. it's important if you're going to do this to understand that seven pay guideline premium test, to know what that seven pay test is and make sure your agent isn't pumping that death benefit way up and filling up their own pockets rather than your own. There's a lot of individuals out there that get involved typically in whole life insurance, cash value life insurance, they're getting started, they're trying to support their family and they're just selling life insurance and they're giving you way more death benefit than you actually need, and you want to lower that and maximize the cash value growth.
Well, if you'd like to know whether or not this type of investment vehicle has a place in your portfolio, I hope you'll use the number on your screen and make a call and request a meeting with a member of the Howard Bailey team. It's a chance to look into the future a little bit and see how your particular portfolio structure is going to provide for your future. Is there the opportunity to provide income that you can't outlive? What about long-term care? Is that provision for in the way your investments are currently structured? And could you be losing progress today to fees, taxes, expenses that you might not have to pay. All valuable things to know and stuff that you'll cover when you sit down with a member of the Howard Bailey team in this complimentary review of exactly what's happening in your portfolio. So the numbers on your screen help you use it and make that appointment soon. All right, when we come back, we're talking to you, asking, answering your questions. So stay with us. At Howard Bailey Financial, every dollar has a purpose. We call it the purpose-based retirement. A certified financial planner will help you decide what you need your retirement money to do for you. We put together a written plan that puts your dollars exactly where you want them to be. And we put every dollar to work to maximize your retirement efficiency. For a higher level of insight and care, choose the purpose-based retirement from Howard Bailey Financial. Call us now to set a complimentary consultation. Time for us to answer viewer questions, and we're going to begin today with Lance from Fort Wayne. How could I be losing money in my bond funds? My broker told me to put the money there for principal protection. Lance, that's a question that a lot of people are asking right now. And we've seen so many people walk into our office, especially towards the end of last year, that were coming in and saying, you know, I've got these bonds. I've got these bond funds, and they're losing money. I, I thought I couldn't lose money in bonds. I've heard that time and time again. And this is because now you're starting to experience what has been talked about so widely since 2008. You know, since we saw interest rates go darn near all the way to zero, and even the risk of them going negative, we knew eventually this was going to be like a compression spring. You know, we press that thing down as hard as we can get, and it's going to pop right back up, and we're going to see interest rates begin to rise. And for most of the investors that we're visiting with, say baby boomers that got started investing in the 80s and 90s, you know, since the 80s, we've seen interest rates falling almost every single year. So interest rates falling consistently over the last basically 40 years, we've seen something happen in the bond market. We've seen equity prices continue to rise in the bond market we saw you continue to collect those interest payments every single coupon continued to get paid into your pocket out of these bond funds in addition as interest rates fell the bonds inside of that fund itself got more valuable because now the bonds that were purchased last year cannot be purchased this year at the same uh, at the same coupon payment for the same term so that made these bonds actually more valuable so you got to appreciate not just the interest that came from those bond funds but the actual capital appreciation also showed up in your portfolio as interest rates fell so you got to benefit from interest rates falling and also collecting your interest payments now we're beginning to see the fed raise interest rates as those interest rates rise, we're going to see the opposite happen. This is something that this generation of investors has never seen. This generation of brokers is not prepared for. Why? Because they may only have bonds and bond funds as their solution for principal protection, and that doesn't work in a rising interest rate environment. As interest rates rise, bond prices will fall. The opposite is going to occur, because the bond that that bond fund is holding today will be less valuable when bonds are paying more of the same quality in the same term next year or the year after. This is why I would encourage you to start evaluating bond alternatives. There have been a lot of articles that have been put out there by researchers, uh, also even universities like Yale, uh, talking about starting to utilize different types of vehicles for those bond holdings rather than just bond funds. And if you have a large enough portfolio, you can even look into owning individual bonds. That might be a better solution than going to a fixed annuity or a fixed indexed annuity for you, depending on how large the portfolio is and what your risk tolerance is. Let's shift away from bonds to Social Security and get to Kristen's question. Go ahead. Hi. Um, how can a piece of Social Security software know when I should take my benefits? Well, Kristen, it can't. 
And so hey, I guess that's about the simplest answer I can give you. It can't. And there's, I think it's really dangerous. I and mean, we had uh, people that have been on the podcast lately that have talked about technology. I mean, Dirk Cotton was a retirement researcher that talked about, you know, how much he appreciates technology, but how dangerous it is right now in the retirement planning field because people are using these pieces of software that don't really understand how to interpret the data or ultimately integrate it with a comprehensive plan. Take this for instance. We had a couple that, and we always do this on the front end, we want to take your social security statement, we want to take your age and plug it into social security software, and we want to identify what the time period we should be taking that benefit is in order to maximize the amount of money we should get from social security. And that's dependent on a number of different factors, such as reinvestment rates, such as cost of living adjustments, how long you're going to live. So there's got to be some assumptions that are made, and those assumptions have to be appropriate. And quite often that software will say, well, you need to wait till age 70 in order to maximize the benefit you're going to get out of Social Security. We recently had a couple that were retiring at 60, and it said you need to take it at 70. Well, once we took into consideration everything else, including their tax planning, doing Roth conversions, we found that it was better for them to take it at 65, and it would cover all their Medicare, put less stress in their portfolio, and we would have a good chunk of the Roth conversions done at that time. And when we took a look at that and plugged everything into the system, used the right assumptions, we found that they shouldn't be filing at 70, they should be filing at 65. So there's a lot of different things to be taken into consideration rather than just plugging in those things. I see a lot of people create their own spreadsheets and make decisions that way, but you need to take a more sophisticated approach. This is a permanent decision and a very big decision. Just think about it this way. If you're going to get 20,000 a year from Social Security, if you use the 4% withdrawal rule on a $500,000 Roth IRA, that's what it would take in order to get that 20,000 a year for the rest of your life. So uh, Garrett in, or excuse me, Lois and Garrett has question uh, via email. She writes, what are your thoughts on Monte Carlo simulations? Well, this, this really goes right along with uh, the podcast guest that I mentioned earlier. You can pick up that podcast at retirewithpurpose.com forward slash podcast. And it was Dirk Cotton of Retirement Researcher. He's a retirement researcher. He runs a retirement cafe blog. He was a statistician. And he said he loves Monte Carlo simulations, uh, but not for the reason you might think. He said, you know, I want to see what that odds of, that odd of success is. So if those odds of success are 90%, that's great. But now I know what to focus on. Now I can focus on the 10% chance of failure because just because I have a 95% chance success or a 90% chance success doesn't mean that that 5 to 10% chance of failure is not going to happen tomorrow because very bad events happen in the market uh, periodically and they're going to happen throughout your lifetime. You just don't know if they're going to happen tomorrow. Maybe the odds are really poor, but they might actually happen tomorrow. So what you can do now is take that 5 to 10% chance of failure and start solving for it. What he said was, you know, what you need to do is say, okay, if that out of if, if that 10% chance of failure includes a major market crash, then I need to take a portion of my portfolio, set that aside, and make sure that I'm always have a place to go in case we have a market crash. If it includes a long-term care risk, and it means that I'm going to have a major long-term care need that results in too much stress in the portfolio, then I need to put in a long-term care solution. Once we've solved for the 10%, then we can start start worrying about the 90% and try to take advantage of the potential that that 90% really offers. Yeah, Casey just mentioned a couple of risks that we all face as we plan for retirement. And that's something that you'll have a chance to review when you meet with a member of the Howard Bailey team. So the number on your screen is the first place to check to request a visit with a member of the Howard Bailey team and, and take a look at what kind of a risk is in your portfolio? What kind of stock market risk is there for you? What about the long-term health care risk? Is that being provisioned for and how your investments are structured today and the biggest challenge we all face lifetime income income you can't outlive does your particular collection of investments account for that now how likely are you to succeed those are all things that you'll review when you sit down with a member of the Howard Bailey team and this complimentary consultation taking a look at your particular situation your particular situation and not somebody else's not an average not a general look 
exactly, exactly what's happening in your world. That's what matters to you, and that's what we'll recover when you uh, call the number on your screen and sit down with a member of the Howard Bailey team. All right, let's uh, get to our question of the day. It has to do with investment for millennials. What generation is least interested in, in investing in the stock market? I think I may have given it away there, but we'll know the answer when we come back. At Howard Bailey Financial, every dollar has a purpose. We call it the purpose-based retirement. A certified financial planner will help you decide what you need your retirement money to do for you. We put together a written plan that puts your dollars exactly where you want them to be. And we put every dollar to work to maximize your retirement efficiency. For a higher level of insight and care, choose the purpose-based retirement from Howard Bailey Financial. Call us now to set a complimentary consultation. Heading into the break, we asked you our question of the day, and it had to do with attitudes toward investing. Which generation is the least interested in investing in the stock market? We know it's not baby boomers, right? It's definitely not baby boomers. It's actually quite the opposite. It's millennials. And so it's you that's most interested in investing in the <laughs> stock market. And it's me that's least interested in investing in the stock market that studies show. And I find it to be very true with the families that we meet with that come in our office. We have someone that's 35, 40 years old versus someone that's 65 or 75 years old. Typically, you find those 65, 75 year olds are much more comfortable being more aggressive, being more invested in the stock market. And the younger individuals say, well, I, I want to be more conservative or they're interested in alternative investments like investing in their own business or starting their own business or getting into real estate for that matter mm -hmm. because of the experience that they've had. The study done by MFS showed that 46% of millennials are not comfortable with ever investing in the stock market. That's a huge number. Yeah. And it's one we have to say, well, why? Why why are we so uncomfortable with investing in the stock market and ultimately how is this shaping your decisions that you're making when it comes to your life savings and how you're investing and what about your financial advisor is the bias due to the experience they had when they started investing bleeding into the advice that they're giving you here today even for myself I found this to be very insightful because I am a very conservative investor and I find other people to be more aggressive even other advisors that are older are much more aggressive than me. Huh. I go, why is that? And I came across this article that I ultimately made part of our weekend reading. We also did a, a podcast regarding this article. This was from Michael Kitsi's blog, and it's one of my favorite blogs to read. We made this part of our weekend reading. It was titled, How Birth Year Shapes a Generational Experience in Stock Market Investing. How Sequence of Returns Risk Isn't Just Important for When It Comes to Your Retirement Date and Your Retirement Withdrawals, But It Can Also Shape the way that you ultimately invest those dollars, and that can lead to success or failure over the long term. So first, let's take a sequence of returns. So we often talk about how a sequence of returns can be a very deadly thing for your retirement. If you retire at the wrong time and start taking withdrawals during a down market, you violate the number one rule of investments, which is buy low and sell high. If you start taking distributions while the portfolio is down, then it's never going to recover. But it doesn't matter. Those sequence of returns don't matter when you're just accumulating assets. For instance, if we took returns of positive 20%, positive 10%, and negative 10, negative 20%, we could see those in that fashion or in the reverse, starting with 100,000, we still end up with $105,600. So, at first glance, we say, well, it doesn't matter when you're actually born and when you start investing because you'll end up with that sequence of returns that ends up with the same end result in the end. The sequence of returns doesn't matter, but it does matter psychologically speaking. If we take a look at retirement date risk, this is where we often talk about the sequence of returns risk being the greatest. That is five years before retirement, let's say, or 10 years before retirement, you're 55, leading up to 65, that's retirement date risk because your portfolio has gotten to be so large the returns in the market have a huge impact on your success of retiring at age 65 you get into retirement now from 65 to 80 those 15 years you have sequence of returns risk at its height if we get into those later years you get into your mid 80s and 90s now you have very limited sequence of returns risk because if you experience a negative return you don't need that portfolio to last nearly as long as you did when you were 65 
55 or 75. And in your early years, you would say sequence of returns risk really doesn't matter because we don't have all that much invested in the first place, but it can still have a psychological effect. Let's take a look at different generational experiences when it comes to their first 10 years of investing experience with investing $1. If we take a look at the early boomers, those born between 1972 and 1981, those individuals that were late boomers, born between 1980, or not born, but investing between 1982 and 1991, these individuals started investing a dollar and it ultimately turned into $5 in their first 10 years of investing. Now if we look at the younger generations, take a look at the Gen Xers and the Millennials. Those individuals started with investing $1 and then 10 years later, they ended up with maybe $2 or actually if we take a look at the late Gen Xers from 99 to 2008 investing during that period of time, they ended up with less than a dollar in their first 10 years of investing experience and that can lead to a very negative attitude that those individuals are going to have towards the stock market. Just as baby boomers might reflect back on those individual experiences they had when they were investing in the 80s and 90s and go, boy, it was such a great market. The market always comes back. It returns 10% a year. I remember those days of 20% returns and 30% returns. They'll always come back. They have a very positive association at the inception of investing in contrast to what we see with that millennial generation. We see these individuals that started with a dollar and ended up with, say, less than $3. Those, er, those individuals that are millennials, those individuals that are late Gen Xers are in that negative association, a negative correlated investing experience versus, versus those individuals that are baby boomers and early Gen Xers that had a very positive investing experience. And that might shape the way that you continue to invest to this day. Maybe you're taking those past returns and going, boy, you know what, the market's such a great place. I'm going to continue to do that moving forward. And this is a different market. It may not perform like it did during your first 10 years of investing experience. And it might lead you to taking on too much risk due to bias you experience. The same thing can be true for a young investor like myself. We may not be taking on enough risk because we have such a negative association with what our experience was like in that first 10 years of investing. The same thing can be true with a financial advisor. And I think this is incredibly insightful. Look at advisors that are currently in their 60s and 50s. When they started working with their clients over the first 10 years, their clients started with a dollar and ended up with four to five dollars and 25 cents in the first 10 years of working with those clients. And they go, boy, the market's such a great place to be. We have to be there. If we look at advisors that are in their 40s, advisors in their 30s, these guys started at one dollar and ended up just around two dollars, maybe a dollar 75, and their clients had to endure a lot of stress just to get a little bit of return. They had a very negative experience, maybe even a traumatic experience with their clients over that period of time. So ask yourself, is when my advisor was born, is when I was born shaping the way that I'm treating my finances moving forward, creating a bias that can negatively impact the success of my retirement plan? You know, that's such an important question. And that attitude thing also applies to as we head into those retirement years, you have to make sure that the person you're working with is in sync with exactly where you're at. And that's one of the chances you'll have. You've called the number on your screen and meet with a member of the Howard Bailey team who will take a look at, are the current investments in your portfolio appropriate for where you are at? Do you have a provision to provide a long-term income? What about paying for health care if you need that in your retirement years, as so many of us will? And then there's the issue of fees, taxes, and expenses that you might be able to avoid. All things we'll review as you sit down with a complimentary consultation with a member of the Howard Bailey team. So we hope you call the number on your screen and request that visit. And we also hope that you'll join us when you see us next week.